um, I, 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 I like to talk about this um, this question of uh, of God after the Holocaust is is it, actually using the greatest, in my opinion, of all the Holocaust writers um, uh, uh, and my go-to of understanding basically the Shoah, which is Elie Wiesel. And um, I'm sure everybody knows, uh, 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 knows Elie Wiesel very, very well. Just a very, very brief kind of uh, uh, um, uh, summary of, of his biography. He's born in a town called Siget in the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, before World War One, that was part of the Hungarian Empire. Um, after World War One, it became a part of Romania. A um, uh, very small Jewish town, about 50% Jews, 50% non-Jews. Real shtetl, uh, uh, um, a traditional uh, Jewish community. Uh, um, Eli himself was brought up in a very orthodox home. His, certainly from his mother's side, was very, very, very influenced by Hasidut. Um, the town was then um, uh, taken over uh, by the Hungarians in 1940, after the first uh, year of the war. Um, a lot of anti-Semitic uh, policies were, were put into place with the Hungarian uh, um, occupation or con taking control of this, this town um, in 1940. Um, the Hungarians uh, were allies to the Germans and um, uh, and so that's one of the reasons why they uh, maintained a lot of anti-Semitic uh, uh, policies. Um, but come towards the end of the war, come 1944, um, the Hungarians began to began to wave aside. They began to, to like flip, um, and they uh, realized that the Germans were losing the war, and they were putting feelers out to the Allies in order to switch sides. Um, uh, and as a result of that, the Germans themselves occupied. Uh, 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 the whole of uh, Hungary in the early spring of 1944 um, and very 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 quickly um, as a result of that a, a town that was totally uh, that, as I say there were certain anti-semitic measures that were in place but nothing compared to what was going to happen all of a sudden you know in the last within the last year of the war the Hungarian Jewish community was totally uh, 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 um, utterly destroyed um, uh, in, in in that spring of 1944, in a very very short amount of time, uh, uh, around about the Pesach time, uh, Siget, for example, there was a, a ghetto was created. The ghetto was then uh, liquidated, um, and Elie Wiesel, together with his family, his his mother, father, and one of his sisters, were taken to Auschwitz Birkenau. Um, his uh, mother and sister were murdered on arrival. Um, and he and his father select, uh, um, survived the selections and after a small time in, in Auschwitz I from Birkenau, they were then sent on to what was called Auschwitz III or Buna, which was a, a slave labor camp, um, was one of the main sub camps of Auschwitz. Um, and Wiesel, as a religious boy, um, found himself uh, working in the uh, in the in the factory um, of Buna um, a, um, alongside a rabbi, and as a young child, this is a pic the picture I've got up of him is the, is a picture taken of him closest to the war. He was sixteen during in nineteen forty four. Um, he was a young Talmudic scholar. I loved to study Talmud Gemara, and when he was in Buna, he sat. He was found himself working next to a Talmudic scholar, a rabbi, and the they spent what Wiesel describes uh, days on end studying Gemara together. And Wiesel describes it as being a uh, uh, Talmud without pages, without without words. It was just by via memory. And one day, this rabbi that Wiesel was studying with invited him and told him, "Please." Um, at the end of your day tonight, I'm talking about in Auschwitz three in Buna, a place of terrible suffering. He was told that one night to leave his barrack and slip out in the middle of the night and come to my barrack, the barrack of the rabbi. That was what Eli Wiesel was told by this rabbi. And Wiesel uh, obviously 
respected this rabbi very much, listened to him, and, um, and he turned up there that night, and he found in that barrack of his rabbi, gathered together that night, all the um, intellectual elites of Buna at the time. There were rabbis, educators, teachers, uh, uh, um, uh, people with, with university degrees, um, had all gathered together. And Wiesel is this, this boy that we're looking at, the face of this boy, was like, like a fly on the wall with all of these great intellects, uh, intellectuals that were, were gathered around. And he doesn't know what's gonna happen. Then all of a sudden there's a bang on the table. And one of the people gathered there shouts out the words, Din Torah, right? A, uh, a Jewish court of law. Wiesel looks around uh, as he describes it, um, who is being brought to, 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 to justice, who is being brought to court. And lo and behold, there's no one there. But in fact, God was brought on trial that night. And that night, as absurd as it sounds, and as farcical as it sounds, um, in Auschwitz III, all of those people gathered there in that barrack put God on trial for crimes against the Jewish people. And um, Wiesel uh, wanted to, it, experienced this this trial and we're going to talk a little bit later i'll talk about what actually happened in the trial but um wiesel uh says that he spent a long 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 time trying to write this up uh, for anyone that's read his, his his seminal work night um uh um you'll this 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 incident of the of the trial of God that took place it doesn't appear. Um, he, uh, by the way, the, the the book night was originally a five hundred page work written in Yiddish, um, and I've, I've, I'm yet to find out if it's the, the 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 incident of the trial was in that unpublished original work of five hundred pages uh, uh, in Yiddish. Eventually, it was translated to to French. Um, but he spent, he, he, Wiesel himself admitted that he spent many, many, many times trying to write up what happened on that night in the trial of God. He did. Maybe he kept it out of the book night because he wanted to make it as a work in itself, a standalone piece of writing. And it, it, it never worked. He couldn't do it. He couldn't make it genuine as a work of writing by writing up what happened. So what he does is he ends up writing a play called The Trial of God, not set in the Holocaust itself, but actually set in the Middle Ages in a, uh, a made up town that underwent a pogrom or a massacre. And, um, and, and, and these Jewish uh, traveling uh, performers turn up to this town and uh, and and um, perform what's called a Purim spiel, like a a, a joke uh, um, performance of this trial of God. And what I'd like, and once you get into the nitty gritty of the of, of, of the play itself and the trial, Wiesel brings up many many different interesting points and uh, a, a, an arguments about faith. Uh, um, in light of suffering, in light of suffering from God. Um, and um, what, what I'd like us to do is, is, is take a look at a few different post-Holocaust theologians, theologians that have, uh, um, that have written after the Holocaust and kind of like reenact this, this trial, if you like. Try and, try and say like, well, what were the different kind of arguments that were made that night? Um, and and let's use these different kinds of thinkers in order to in order to create a language to talk about God in, in light of the Holocaust. So um, the first thinker that I want to uh, uh, talk about is a man by the name of uh, Rabbi Ignaz Maybaum. Um, I don't find his picture particularly sympathetic, uh, but it was the only picture I could find uh, um, uh, for the presentation. 
Um, Ignaz Maybaum uh, originally born in Vienna. He was ordained as a, as a rabbi um, in Berlin um, and um, was with, I think in 1936, if I'm not mistaken, was actually arrested by the Gestapo for being a rabbi. Um, but eventually come 1938, we managed to, to get to visa him to Great Britain. He was employed by the United Synagogue of Great Britain and it ended up becoming um, uh, the, the rabbi of the Reform Community of London um, from, uh, the, uh, from the late 30s all the way through until the 70s. And if we think about who Ignaz Maybaum was as a, uh, as, as, a, as a rabbi and as a theologian, he was a classic reform thinker. Um, I'd even call him, uh, it's a little bit rude to use this, I'll even call him a dinosaur. Um, let me explain what I mean. Um, out of the reform movement, when it first was created um, in the 19th century in Germany and, and, and subsequently in the United States, but not so much the story of the United States to be in, in its early years, um, was um, a uh, was was anti-nationalistic um, in terms of its Jewish identity. Let, let's put it this way: it was um, they wanted to get rid of any element about what it meant to be Jewish that represented being Jewish as a, as a, as a nation. Uh, um, uh, we, if you think about, it, there are three main pillars about what it means to be a Jew. There's the, the or part of the Jewish nation. There's the people, there's the land, and then there's the religious teachings, the Torah. The reform community in the end of the 19th century wanted to uh, um, get rid of two of those, the nationhood and the land. It was anti-Zionist. Uh, they renamed all of their synagogues, temples, um, because uh, according to traditional Judaism, there's only meant to be one temple, um, one Bet Hamikdash anywhere in the world uh, in Yerushalayim that comes along the Reform movement and says, no, 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 we can have temples wherever we want. Uh, they stopped facing Jerusalem in prayer. Hebrew was removed from the um, Hebrew was removed from uh, from the, the, the language of prayer, and uh, Maybaum really kept to that uh, spirit about what it meant to be a reformed Jew. Um, I say that he was a dinosaur because um, one of the things that I admire the most about the reform movement, especially in America, after the Holocaust, was that this anti-Zionist, anti-nationalist spirit of the reform movement that was the classic way of, reform way of thinking changed after the Shoah. Uh, in fact, I'd like to say that they were really the, one of the only religious groups and or even political groups that really did a soul searching process and changed this whole um, notion of, of, of what it means to be Jew, a Jew. Instead of being a, a, a just, you know, a, 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 the classic was a, a, a German of a mosaic persuasion, right? Um, instead of that, they realized that actually were part of this nation. And the, the, the reform movement became more and more Zionist uh, um, as, as, as the years went on, especially when they started sending um, all uh, rabbinical students of HUC into, into Jerusalem for a year. That was a real big moment as well. But, the, but all of this whole process of the Zionist, you know, it became more and more Zionist uh, after, uh, after the Shoah. Maybaum, however, was a dinosaur because he didn't move with the times. He was stuck in uh, this, 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 this place of, of, of what it means to be a Jew is purely a religious way of thinking um, and not a nationalistic way of thinking. And, um, and, and what's interesting about him is that even though he was a like, classic reform thinker, progressive, um, he had a very, 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 uh, I'd say conservative with a small c approach to theology. Um, he, believed, and this was his response to uh, 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 the Shoah in his, in his work, The Face of God After Auschwitz, he, he had a classic theological response to the Holocaust. And the classical theological response is that whenever there is 
human suffering, and especially Jewish suffering, that uh, 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 um, Jewish suffering is brought about for a reason. And according to, to, to Maybaum, what was the reason why Jews were being punished by God in the Holocaust? He says the following idea. He says this, that, that after every destruction of, that happened to the Jewish people, happened to the Jewish people, a new way of thinking was brought about. So, um, the, he says the first destruction of the Jewish people took place with the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians, 586 BCE. That was, what was the new thing that, the, the lesson that was learned from the destruction of the first temple was that Jews need to leave Israel and join the diaspora and be, a, be, be, be a, out in the world uh, uh, much more. Um, the second destruction, the destruction of the second temple taught, what was the, the suffering of the second temple taught the Jewish people that they no longer needed to do sacrifices, animal sacrifices, but could rather uh, serve God through prayer. And then the third horban or the third destruction, which was the destruction of, 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 uh, of European Jews um, in the Shoah, teaches the Jews it was like literally a, 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 a lesson that God was teaching the Jewish people to rid themselves of, to rid themselves of the medieval way of being a Jew. Just to, 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 to have this, this quote uh, that I've put up on the board here, after every Chorban, the Jewish people made a decisive progress and mankind progresses with us. After the third Chorban, that of our own time, the Jewish diaspora has become a world diaspora. The medieval organization has been destroyed. You can be a Jew outside the din, the Jewish law. What Maybaum argues is that the Chorban of European Jews in the Holocaust brings about the realization that we no longer have to be like medieval um, old style of being a Jew, we can now be modern, which means no longer observant of traditional rabbinic halacha. We get Jewish law. We need to progress. And literally, um, literally, God is bringing about the destruction. Even use Christian's terms. He says, the Golgotha of modern mankind is Auschwitz. The cross was replaced by the gas chambers. Just as, uh, as, as, as the suffering in Christian theology of Jesus on the cross brings about the savior of the world, similarly says the suffering of the Jews in the Holocaust was a device done, carried out by God himself in order to teach us something new, to teach us the way we need to be. Um, I'm just interested if anybody would like to, 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 to just, well, if anybody that hasn't heard of Ignaz Maybach before in his theology, um, how, how do you respond to that? Anybody want to, to, to shout out? How do, Andrea, do I unmute everybody? Does that work? Oh yes, I can unmute everyone. Thank you. Just unmute everyone. I, I'm interested to see just uh, anybody um, want to, um, have a response to Maybaum. Uh, what do you think about? Uh, or a type of message. Anyway, it's offensive. It's offensive. Why do you find it offensive, Laurie? Laurie? Yes, um, because he's um, dismissing the theology of most of the world's Jews and of those who were killed for adhering to it and saying, you know, in a sense, it's their fault that God had to do this. If they would have seen the light and given up on their theology earlier and become reformed Jews, then we wouldn't have had to have the Holocaust. Um, what I, I, I Laurie, I, 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 I personally agree with you and I share your sentiments. Um, um, but what I find so interesting about Maybaum is that even though he's a reform thinker, 
he is saying exactly the same as what we find in many of the ultra-Orthodox world. Um, there's a blame game that goes on. Um, you, the ref, he, as a reform thinker, is saying, you ultra-Orthodox, even geographically, you could say, over there in the East, you medieval Jews, you archaic Jews, you were to blame. But what I find so fascinating, it's the same theological um, process is carried out by the next thinker that I wanted to bring out, which is it was Rabbi Al Teichelbaum of Satma. He says exactly the same. This is what I find so um, interesting and intriguing. You've got the most reform of the reform uh, uh, um, uh, uh, of Rabbi Ignaz Mayban, classical reform, and you've got Rabbi Al Teichelbaum of the Sat Satma, uh, 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 the head of the Satma Hasidim, um, saying virtually the same theological idea, but from a different perspective. Um, uh, he basically, to quote him in his, in his, in his work, by Yoel Moshev, 1958, the Holocaust is God's punishment of the Jewish people of its, for its sins, and primarily for the sin of Zionism. The Zionist concept implied a denial of God's ability to deliver his people and, um, and disrupted the natural place. Uh, sorry, I've lost the it's sort of the natural place of the people of Israel destined to remain in the exile until the true deliverance. He plays on a very, very famous uh, piece, uh, passage in the Talmud that talks about um, that, that, that talks about this idea of the three oaths that the Jewish people must stay in the diaspora, must stay in exile until basically God brings them back. And uh, uh, because Zionism, and especially secular Zionism, breaks these oaths, that's why and starts to this process of bringing the Jewish people back um, to the land of Israel. Um, um, it's for that reason that the Holocaust and uh, your your old title bank goes even further, and he says it, it, it doesn't. It, it, it's the opposite of the opposite, as they'd say in, in Israel. It's even worse than that. Um, what was the reason, according to to, to classic uh, uh, redemption theory? Why were the Jewish people exiled? Uh, the Jewish people were exiled because they didn't keep the Torah. Now, second, and the reason why we'll come back to the land is because. If we keep the Torah, then we can get back. Secular Jews are now telling us to come back. Right. Uh, yeah, Laurie, uh, you wanted to say something. Both are rooted in the Torah because it's different concepts of sin. There's the sin of doing the sacrifices, but keeping the letter of the law and not the spirit. And there's a passage in the Bible where it says, I don't want your sacrifices, you know, go and help your brothers and things like that. Right, right, and right, then right. the other one is saying, you know, of course the land is going to expel you if you don't keep these precepts. Right. right. But so, I actually think that the second one is worse because he's saying that the sin is Zionism. But it's also a very extreme view, which was modulated and modified later on by most of the ultra-Orthodox. Correct, 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 correct. The, the, the point that I want to make, the point I want to make about it that I find so fascinating and, 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 and that you can put Ignaz Maybaum and Yol Teitelbaum together, even though they're from the eggs, the poles apart in terms of the content of what they're saying, um, the, the theological process, however, is, 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 is the same. God is at the center. And, 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 and whatever reason you want to say why it's happening, they're going to disagree on that. Um, but they're going to, but, 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 but the point that could have been raised and was raised that night um, but in the trial of God that, 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 that Wiesel experienced was God is punishing us for our sins. What that sin is, we can argue about it and we can talk about it. But, the, but the, the, the real feeling was at that time, if this position I want to bring up now is that God is at the center. 
And God is, when we suffer, it's because of God's sins. Yes, Laurie, you wanted to say something. This is probably a later part of your Sorry. presentation, but who, who came up with the idea, somebody then came up with the idea, you know, of uh, when good people, when bad things happen to good people, that it's not necessarily God is punishing them. I'm so, sure somebody. We'll, we'll, get, we'll, 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 we'll get onto that. We'll get onto good, that. Good, good. Okay, I'll be quiet. Uh, okay. Uh, there's another I'd glory like Hollander. Yes. Um, on the one hand, both of these remind me of the of the Christian creatures who, when there's an earthquake or a hurricane, say this is the punishment for uh, for tolerating homosexuality. You're taking this tragedy and you're using it to try to put forward your agenda, and and that is something that I think is hugely problematic. But I think there's a difference between Teitelbaum and 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 the uh, uh, the dinosaur in that Teitelbaum is talking about punishment, whereas the reform rabbi, he's saying, well, this is telling us to get away from Dean, away from judgment. And therefore, it's he's not viewing it as punishment. He's viewing it as a teachable moment. Here is what God is trying to teach us. Um, so I think in that respect, the two are, are, are very different. It's interesting. It's an interesting point, and the difference between we could get into this in, in greater detail, but, but I, I think Maybaum might argue that all suffering uh, that is brought about from God, um, or, or all punishment brought about from God, is in punishments that we have, is there in order to teach us something. It's not just the old title Baum, and it's also saying, you know, what's the lesson we need to learn? Um, but I agree with, oh, massively with your, your first point, is they're just using and manipulating the Holocaust to talk about what they wanted to say anyway. Rabbi Yol Teitelbaum was, was, was uh, ultra-Orthodox before, and the Holocaust happened, proves I need to be ultra-Orthodox now. Maybaum was, uh, 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 was reformed before, I'm gonna use the Holocaust to prove what I need to be, I, I, I need to be now. Um, We've got multiple people uh, raising their hand. I can't see who you are. Um, Bruce, yes. Bruce, then Esther. Yeah, um, you don't have to ascribe to the theology that it's God's punishment to believe that there might be lessons that can be learned. I realize you're looking at theologians at this point and thinkers, right. but um, you can still say, well, there's some lessons to learn without saying that it's, you know, God caused what happened. Correct. Correct. I agree. But the, the, okay, absolutely. Yeah, um, Esther, you're muted, Esther. How's that? Esther, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. I do believe, if I am not mistaken, oh, Esther. It, hello, Francis. Hello, hello, Esther Ruth. How are you, darling? Hello. We'll talk later. Yes. Um, I do believe that there are um, uh, followers of the idea that the state, uh, Israel is not a legitimate state and they do not recognize the government. It was not brought about by God. Uh, and I doubt among those believers, you would find people who call themselves liberal Jews. I think liberal Jews today are proud of Israel and and uh, Zionism, they have uh, definitely moderated their views. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree with you. Yes. And that's one of the reasons why I call Ignaz Maybaum a dinosaur. Uh, I yes, that's a good. You see uh, what I'm saying? That's what that, yes. that's why I call him a. He 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 was he was writing in the in the 60s um, uh, um, when in Britain when American Jewry in in was was going in a totally different direction. Oh. But may I may I ask, uh, would you call someone who holds the idea that the state is not legitimate, the Israeli government is not legitimate, would you call that person a dinosaur today? Uh, <laughs> um, brilliant question. Um, you know, uh, first of all, I, in terms just, just in terms of the Haredi world and their relationship to to, to Israel and Zionism today. 
Um, it's changed massively in the past 30 years, 30 to 40 years. Um, the Haredi Judaism, the, the mainstream Haredi Judaism today, is, is, it won't, they wouldn't say that they were Zionists per se. They, they were not going to send their children to, to serve in the army. But they've recognized and realized that the state of Israel is extremely beneficial towards them and their, and, and their way of life. Um, and therefore, the, 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 those that are still hold on to that, um, that, that position, that extreme position of, of, of total rejection of, of, of Zionism and the lack of legitimacy of the Israeli government, um, I, I suppose, yes, they're still, they're still there, uh, but they're, 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 they're on the fringes of Haredi society today. Um, you do, uh, um, so maybe, yeah, I would agree that they will probably also be called dinosaurs uh, in terms of, in the context of the community. You don't only have to look in the past uh, uh, um, 20, 30 years how integral Haredi uh, political parties are to the, to the governments in Israel and uh, to, to see how, how, how much things have changed um, in terms of that relationship with the state of Israel. Anyway, I, I, if it's okay, I want to move on. Uh, so so, so I, I, I kind of like, we've, we started with one position, which was the position of, um, oh, there's lots of people that want to talk um, or chat. So, okay. Um, uh, we started off with uh, uh, one, the first position, really, which shared by them, which, which God is at the center. God is, God is causing uh, um, a punishment in order to teach us a new lesson. So what do you think is going to be, God is at the center. Uh, uh, Maybaum even uses this language that, that, that God, uh, Hitler was God's instrument in teaching us what we needed to know. So what do you think is the opposite end of that? And that is the uh, very, very, very famous uh, Richard Rubenstein, American born um, uh, uh, position. Um, uh, where he basically, first of, for Rubenstein, um, uh, for, for, for Rubenstein, he starts with this idea that the Holocaust was totally unique. Unlike Maybaum and other traditional theological thinkers in response to the Holocaust, that turn around and say that the Holocaust is just another series of punishments or sufferings that the Jewish people have suffered in order to teach us a lesson, Rubenstein says no. The Holocaust is a unique event. event. Uh, to quote the quote that I put up uh, that, that, that represents this, the problem of God and death and the death camps is the central problem of Jewish theology in the 20th century. We cannot understand God, our relationship with God, theology as our understanding of God in the 20th century without looking at the Holocaust. And he comes up with this very, 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 um, very logical and, and dare I say, compelling argument. He basically says this, the traditional understanding of God that Jews have always had throughout the centuries the traditional God of history, the God that pulls the strings of history and interacts with the world, has got two main um, characteristics. Characteristic number one of this God is that God is um, all good, is a good, benevolent, loving God. Element number two of God is that God is all powerful. And God has the ability to change the world and to, to change history. Rubenstein says it's pure math. God, the traditional God is all good and all powerful. And yet the Holocaust happened. Yet one and a half million children were brutally killed in the Holocaust. So it must be two, one of two things. Either it means, let's say for argument's sake, that God is all good, and yet he didn't stop the Holocaust from happening. It must mean, therefore, that he's weak. Because an all good God couldn't let such terrible suffering to happen. 
The alternative is, is if that God is all powerful and did have the ability to change the world and to save the Jews from such terrible suffering, it must therefore mean that he can't be all good. Because an all powerful God, all powerful God, if he was good, would have saved the Jews. And therefore, um, Rubinstein comes up with this idea, which is the death of God, the death of the God of history. God lo lo no longer controls the way in which the world works. To quote him, and I've got the quote here. Um, well, oh, sorry, back. He says, when I say we live in the time of the death of God, I mean, the thread uniting God and heaven and earth has been broken. We stand in a cold, silent, unfeeling cosmos, unaided by any purposeful power beyond our own resources. Just to clarify for a moment, it's not that Rubenstein believes that God is... Um, God was, the God of history was ever really alive, ontologically, right? The, the God wasn't really, in reality, ever there. It's just that we would never had enough evidence in the world to prove it otherwise until the Holocaust happened. The Holocaust shatters everything, shatters, shatters our understanding of God forever, and it cannot, that cannot go back. Um, And what's interesting about Rubenstein, uh, and what I find really compelling about Rubenstein, is that he doesn't, he doesn't believe in it, or, or really interesting, is that he still remains a rabbi, and he still remains committed to, to, to Jewish life. Um, in light of his understanding of, um, his understanding of, of, of the death of God, and he talks about this kind of reconstructionist way of uh, reconstructionist way of, uh, of of being Jewish without the God of history. Um, for example, um, instead of understanding our festivals through their historic meaning, they should go back to their their their, their original meaning, which was the the the, the, the their natural their natural uh, uh, um, uh, um, roots, which was the, the, the agricultural festivals. He believes very much in returning Judaism to nature. And God, um, if you like, being the, understood not as the God of history, but the God of nature. Um, very similar to Spinoza, if you like. Um, but certainly, I think, just from getting it into the our perspective, um, or, or, or in, back into the idea of the uh, of the uh, of the trial of God, um, certainly I'm sure there were those there that talk about. Well, now I don't believe in God anymore. Now there's as a result, and and, and, and hugely hugely compelling uh, argument. For those that say that the, what our understanding of God, what was, it can no longer be anymore. Um, I'm just interested, uh, out of fairness, uh, um, does anyone else want to, any, any responses to, to Rubenstein? How do people feel about, about this position? Anybody like to share? It, it, it strikes me, um that now we know how many, so many other peoples have been exterminated throughout history. And yet for us, the one that broke the camel's back is the, the European Holocaust. Um, but it, it, this wasn't the first time God permitted something like that to happen to a people. Right, 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 right. It's, it, it's very interesting because because all of these thinkers are, are, are really looking at like a, the, the internal Jewish response. Who, and what does it mean for me to be uh, from us as the Jewish people? How do we respond theologically and, uh, and religiously? Um, but yeah, but yeah, it's interesting uh, uh, to say this happened to other people, but 
Um, anyway, I, I, look, it's, it, 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 it's hard. It's a hard one to take, um, especially uh, for the, even though I find it like logically very, very compelling, especially for those that, 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 that want to maintain having a relationship with, it, with, it, with a God, not to feel like we live in this cold cosmos. Are there any other, uh, other ways, ways of looking at it? Um, so I want to introduce uh, um, the fourth and last of the, uh, of the thinkers that I want to bring in front of you, which is um, Rabbi Eliezer Berkovich, a um, uh, modern Orthodox Zionist um, uh, uh, thinker. Um, and um, um, Eliezer Berkovich um, has got two, starting point, firstly, I find, I find very, very, very important. The first thing that he brings to the table is this idea of um, making a distinction between what he describes as those that are Job and Job's brothers. Um, Job, the, the, the tragic character from the Bible who represents the idea of innocent suffering, those that suffered for no reasons. And uh, that is the, the uh, most interesting uh, uh, book one of the most interesting books of the Bible because it goes against general theology of the Bible. The general theology of the Bible is uh, you do good, you get blessed. Uh, you do bad, you get punished. Um, comes along Job and, 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 and brings, what, what about innocent suffering? How, what, what does that mean? And uh, um, it's a it re real fascinating uh, work within, within the Tanakh, within the Bible. But uh, uh, Berkovich himself, though, makes a distinction between Job, who suffered, and Job's friends who came to talk to him. He said that we himself, I say we in terms of him and me, um, and I don't know who's here, but he said, we who didn't suffer, we, I was not a Holocaust survivor, I'm, uh, I'm the grandson of Holocaust survivors. I am not the same as someone that, I am, I'm affected by the Holocaust, but I, I, I wasn't there myself. My grandparents were, but I was not. And um, therefore, um, we need to distinguish ourselves between Job, the survivors, those that went through, or, and those that went through it, and us that came after it. That, and why does he say this? is because actually it's very interesting in, 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 when I meet Holocaust survivors in Yad Vashem and the, in the, the question of religiosity comes up, the general rule is, is that most Holocaust survivors stayed the same. If they were religious before, they tend to be religious afterwards. Obviously there are exceptions. If they were secular before, they tend to be secular. That, that, that's, that, that's the norm. Um, but that being said, there are those that went through the Shah that lost their faith as a result of the Holocaust. And Berkovich says that there's something very, very holy about that. As in, who, who, who on earth am I? to turn around to a Holocaust survivor that lost their faith and say, no, 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 you got it wrong. God's punishing us for a reason. God exists. I would, I, 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 how could I ever dream of doing that? But similarly though, in the same sense, there are those Holocaust survivors that maintained their faith, that kept their faith despite everything. And in the exact same way, how could I turn around to a Holocaust survivor that kept their faith and say, no, 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 you got it wrong. The Holocaust teaches me that this, this God that you still believe in doesn't exist. And Berkovich says, we are Job's brothers. We didn't go through it ourselves. And therefore, we cannot uh, make a, we need to be respectful of, 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 of both the positions of those that went through the experience of the Shah, to, 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 to use his, his, his 
quote, the faith, the faith affirmed was superhuman. The loss of faith in the circumstances, human. The faith is holy, but so also is the disbelief. And the religious rebellion of the concentration camps, holy. In other words, there's something holy. There's something untouchable. There's, there's something, something that we need to respect in terms of both positions, of both those that maintain their faith and those that lost their faith. Um, and so therefore what? So therefore what? Okay, so, okay. First of all, I, 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 Berkovich is teaching us modesty. Not to say that we need to come up with an answer. But therefore what? So the first thing that Berkovich is, is, is famous for is what's classified as the, um, as the uh, free will defense. Uh, the free will defense. That basically says, um, God didn't carry out the Holocaust, man did. Man has the power to choose between good and evil. And um, in, during the times of the Holocaust, human beings chose the ultimate evil uh, in the acts that they carried out in the Holocaust. Don't blame God, blame man. Um, to, to, to quote him, even more important than the question, where was God, is where was man, says Berkovich. Um, but he says something very, he doesn't leave it at that though, because he, he uses actually a traditional religious idea that's found in Tehillim, in the Psalms, to explain this free will defense. He uses this idea in Hebrew of hester panim, the hiding of God's faith, face. God hides his face, stops interacting with the world in order to allow humans to make their own decisions, of their own free will. But just as God hides his face, there are certain times in history, though, when God shines his face. And God comes back in. Because if God is always hidden, then it's basically the same position as Rubenstein. So when does God shine his face? Why does God interact with history? Says Berkovich, it came about three years later. It came about three years later, um, at, the, at the end of the Holocaust, with the creation of the state of Israel. Um, uh, to quote him, God hides in human responsibility and human freedom, but in the transfiguration of a profane existence into a new birth in eternity, there God cannot hide. And he's talking about here the birth of the state of Israel. When the state of Israel is created just three short years later after the end of World War II, for Berkovich, that is the shining of God's face. When when good things happen, to, when bad things happen, that's humans. But the great intervention, the great redemption that took place, which is the creation of the state of Israel, that's an example of God lifting up the veil and shining his face uh, uh, um, once more. 